Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us from around the world and to those participants at the International Coral Reef Symposium. Coral reefs, as all of you are very familiar, play a critical role in the economic prosperity and well-being of hundreds of millions of people in the world and more than 100 coral reef countries around the world as well. The bad news is that the clock is ticking uh, for the very existence of coral reefs, which are at the highest risk ever seen before, and their very future is hanging in the balance. The problem is, of course, with humans and our activities whose effects are both felt locally through things like overfishing and pollution, and globally with ocean warming and acidification due to rising greenhouse gas emissions. The coming year, and indeed the decade, likely is to offer the last chance for bringing together our collective efforts to change this current trajectory of coral reefs to one heading on a slow but steady pace to recovery. The good news is that it, this is possible. Welcome to the event today uh, that entitled Rebuilding Coral Reefs, a Decadal Grand Challenge. My name is Christian Teleki. I am the Global Director of the Ocean Program at the World Resource Institute and also have the pleasure of serving as the Director of the Friends of Ocean Action, working with the World Economic Forum and Head of the Secretariat for the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's session. The event is organized under the auspices of the 14th International Coral Reef Symposium 2021 by Future Earth Coast and the International Coral Reef Society and partners, including the German Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety, UN Environment Program, the International Coral Reef Initiative, Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation and the Kellner and Stoll Foundation for Climate and Environment. During our discussion today, we'll have some terrific panelists who will be sharing some of their thoughts and views on the new science to policy paper, Rebuilding Coral Reefs, a Decadal Grand Challenge, that has launched today and has been developed by a team of world-renowned experts led by the International Coral Reef Society. The paper itself, which you hear more about shortly, attempts to address the urgent need to make sure the state and knowledge of regarding coral reef science is made available. To, information, to inform policy development and implementation. Really want to mainstream the science and use it over this next decade. Because I said earlier, this is gonna be a critical one for coral reefs. The paper itself will be available to download um, following the close of this event. And the link to the download this will be made available in the chat, but also you can find it on the International Coral Reef Society's uh, website as well later today. Uh, for today's event, we'll kick off with uh, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean, and then this will be followed by a brief of uh, presentation from the two of the report's authors themselves. We'll get some firsthand insights on some of the key messages, the takeaway points from the paper, um, and so that when you dive into it, you know what you'll be uh, heading into and looking for in this uh, terrific paper. Um, we'll then have some reactions to the paper for some key policy actors, some reflections from around the world, people who are thinking about this on their day-to-day -day jobs, and how do we take science and really inform policy and the importance of science to underpin some of the decision-making that's going on, not only for coral reefs, but some of the other uh, ecosystems that are adjacent to coral reefs as well. I'm also hopeful that we can dig into some of the Q&A you know, from those on the line you'll be very familiar with on how to submit your questions. Um, and we'll try to get to some of them. Can't be sure that we'll get to all of them, but we'll know that I get to some of them on the line. Um, and I also encourage some of those, uh, some of our experts, uh, the, some of the authors of the paper who are on the line as well to take a stab at, at answering some of those, those questions as we're uh, going through. I also think it's really important when we think about science to policy that we're as, as so stakeholders as this, how do we think about this not in sort of a single issue, but how do we sort of you know, use the science um, that's being suggested and coming out of the coral reef community to support the, you know, the important pending negotiations, including, you know, COP26, the climate change uh, summit later this year, or COP15, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, meeting the parties, some really important decisions being discussed there, and linking to some of the other key, you know, key moments um, where policymakers really want to draw upon that science that they can understand, um, and it's going to be important why they understand it for the decisions they're making for not only the health of coral reefs, but really the connections that coral reefs play as far as our well-being and economy is concerned. So just before we get started, a little few housekeeping notes for you, if I may. Um, as you will have seen, this uh, noted that the Zoom webinar, this is a Zoom webinar that's being uh, recorded and will be made available on the ICRS uh, website uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, so you can come back and revisit this. No doubt there'll be lots of pearls of wisdom and things that you want to, re, uh, to revisit. That'll, there's a, a link to the chat. You'll be able to find that and, and send that out to your colleagues. Um, 
the event is also being live streamed. Um, there's a link also in the chat to where you can share that on your social media, um, send notes around to colleagues who may have not joined it so far, but there are, uh, you think should probably you know, join in some of the discussion here. Um, really would love it if you, you know, use the Q&A function to uh, submit your questions, your comments. Um, as I said, we'll probably not get to all of them, but we'll certainly try to get to some of them and, uh, and encourage some of the authors on the line, also in some of the panel, to jump in and, and answer those live and, and keep this very dynamic and some of the discussion going here. And finally, there is an option for uh, automated generated subtitles um, that you can activate at the closed caption button at the bottom right of your screen uh, to near to the uh, leave button. If you just see, it's just to the left of um, the leave button there. It says live transcript. So do please you know, uh, click that. Um, if you want to have some subtitles there. So with that, let's get started. I'm delighted to welcome the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean, Peter Thompson, who has been uh, working tirelessly over the last three years at really trying to maintain the profile uh, and the agenda um, of uh, Sustainable Development Goal 14 in particular, but also a great effort at connecting SDG 14 into the whole range of other SDGs, SDGs as well. And that we've solved a number of these issues in the ocean, we can solve a number of these big challenges that are outlined under uh, the sustainable development goals. And indeed, I know coral reefs, um, Peter, as a Fijian, are dear, near and dear to your heart. And uh, no doubt you'll say something about that. But Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, warm greetings to all present uh, from a uh, heat wave London, where I currently am based. Um, and thank you for the honor of addressing you today. And congratulations to the organizing partners of today's event. Uh, the International Coral Reef Society, Future Earth Coast, International Coral Reef Initiative, to the UN Environment Program, German Ministry for the Environment, His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, and the Keller and Stoll Foundation for Climate and Environment. Please allow me to say something personal. My family has lived for six generations on a small peninsula in the South Pacific, protected on three sides by a massive coral barrier reef. I cannot imagine a world without coral, but we must face the fact that a calamity of, ex of existential proportions for our species is looming. From the reports of the IPCC, of IPBES, and of WMO, to the daily ecological disasters witnessed around the world, we're coming to understand the scale of the environmental effects of global warming. As night follows day, if we continue on the current track of warming, throughout the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren, Malthusian effects will be kicking in with increasing frequency and ferocity. We're in the middle of one of those effects right now with this COVID-19 pandemic. Coral is the flashing signal of our predicament. The IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels states with very high confidence that 70 to 90% of, of tropical coral reefs existing today will disappear even if global warming is constrained to 1.5 degrees. Coral reefs are home to up to a quarter of marine life. They are the bunkers of marine biodiversity. And it's an understatement to say their loss will have major consequences for the health of the ocean. At this point, remember that we cannot have a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. Our predicament is that we're not heading to a destination of 1.5 or 2 degrees. The world is currently on track for warming of over 3 degrees by the end of the century. That prediction, ladies and gentlemen, is the deeply considered advice of the World Meteorological Organization. As Secretary General Antonio Guterres put it in his State of the Planet speech in New York last year, humanity is involved in a suicidal war with nature and that it's now time for us to make peace. So ladies and gentlemen, in your work here today and everything that flows from it, please see yourselves as part of the international force dedicated to making peace with nature. You may take it from these remarks that Coral's place must be front and center in international meetings considering ocean and climate change. And in the blue-green recovery road presenting itself as the logical way ahead, saving and restoring coral reefs is an essential element of the journey. For as I've often pointed out, 
There cannot be that healthy planet without a healthy ocean, and that requires the survival of coral reefs. In the progression of UN conferences over the next 12 months, the UN Food Systems Summit in New York, the CBD conference in Kunming, the UNFCCC conference in Glasgow, UNEA 5 in Nairobi, and the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon in June next year. We must ensure that the challenges facing coral and their consequences for human security are fully understood by all. Led by science, we must identify the innovative solutions for coral survival and shift the climate finance needle in their direction. We must refuse a future without tropical reefs. Working to save coral reefs is at the very front line of good works in which a responsible human being can be involved in these precarious times. We can stiffen our resolve to do so by accepting intergenerational justice as the abiding light that guides us. So with those words, I wish you well in your deliberations today and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Peter. Powerful words, uh, pow powerful words. Uh, they're really clearly a personal connection for you with, with um, as far as coral reefs are concerned. And I think you know, your sentiment there of refusing a future without coral reefs um, would echo throughout the participants on the line and indeed our distinguished panelists. And I think that notion of really stiffening our resolve uh, for coral reefs is, is really something I think is a strong theme that's gonna come through uh, in that. So again, thank you, Peter, and thank you for all your leadership and your fantastic efforts at you know, keeping this high on the agenda. Hopefully we'll come back to you at the end and an opportunity if there's any further questions from the audience. So again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, I'd now like to turn to uh, the actual substance on the, um, the uh, uh, in terms of the, um, the paper itself and, and the, you know, rebuilding coral reefs, a decade old grand challenge. And I'm, and I'm really delighted that we have two of the authors here, Nancy Knowlton, the Smithsonian Institution and one of the lead authors on the paper. And then David Abura from Cordero, East Africa, and a contributing author based in Mombasa. Um, Nancy and David, can I you know, turn to you to give us some insights you know, on this paper, give it a little bit of color. Um, most on the line will not have read it yet, but no doubt are very keen to hear from you both. So over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Can you hear me? We can hear you and see you perfectly. Please go ahead. Okay, so if we could... Um, um, have the, the slides from the paper, please. And while they're coming up, let me just say uh, thank you for everyone who was involved in uh, putting this event together and the many people that were involved in putting the paper together, uh, both the authors, but many people who supported the process of collecting all the information and putting it in a format that is useful, not only to scientists, but also to policymakers. So I still don't see the first slide. Um, if I could get that, please. We're just, I think the slides are coming up, I'm told. Okay, so, no problem. Yeah, bear with us. Everyone's very familiar with the virtual environment. Never, the best made plans never go to plan. So uh, speaking yeah. of the virtual environment, please excuse any trucks noises that come by <laughs> outside my library uh, for good internet access. It's early morning here in rural Maine. Ah, there we go. There we go. And there, we're good to go. Already, thanks Probably so here. much. And um, can I have the next? Yes, there you go. Over to you, Nancy. Okay, great, thank you. So I'd like to begin uh, with a point of, which of course has been made already by, um, by this, the, the remarks that have been made and that is the incredible importance of uh, coral reefs and when you add up all the people that benefit from coral reefs, that actually totals over half a billion people. Uh, and reefs themselves are part of uh, 100 countries around the world. 
And uh, many of these countries are low-income countries, so they're incredibly important in terms of the livelihoods of people. And of course, people benefit from reefs even when they don't live in a country that has coral reefs. If I can have the next slide. So the benefits uh, of these uh, that reefs provide are very diverse. They include tourism and fisheries, which provide significant income and revenue. It's been estimated that the annual value of coral reefs uh, is about 10 trillion US dollars, uh, which is quite a large number. Next slide. They also uh, provide important protection to uh, coastal environments because uh, coral reef acts as a, as a powerful uh, block to any large waves incoming either from uh, major storms or, or tsunamis. And the, the blocking effect of coral reefs reduces wave energy considerably, uh, therefore reduces flooding and as, as a consequence saves uh, a lot of money and lives around the world. And finally, next slide. Um, the reefs provide to people uh, food, uh, pharmaceutical products, and of course also very important spiritual and cultural values um, for the people that um, live in close proximity of reefs. And of course, it's not just um, the reefs themselves that, um, it's not just people themselves that benefit from reefs. Uh, one third, one quarter, or perhaps even one third of all ocean creatures are associated with reefs, which is really a remarkable uh, statistic when you consider that the reefs themselves only cover about 0.1% of the total ocean area. And so reefs are very, very important to people and all of ocean life. Can I have the next slide? Unfortunately, as has been noted, many reefs have already been lost. And I uh, sadly, early on in my career, saw this firsthand. I was a graduate student on the north coast of Jamaica uh, and the reefs were in, uh, covered with living coral when I began my studies. And by the time I was a beginning professor, uh, most of those corals were dead. And this has been a pattern that's been repeated uh, in a variety of places around the world. Can I have the next slide? Uh, there are a number of reasons for this, uh, most notably, uh, in recent decades have been the effect of heat waves uh, that have caused massive coral bleaching events. Also uh, the same process that causes increasing temperature that is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That carbon dioxide also dissolves into the ocean, changes the chemistry, and uh, that in increases the fragility of our reefs as well. So these effects of, of greenhouse gas emissions have been very substantial, but they are not the only cause of reef mortality. And in fact, the reefs that I saw disappear in Jamaica were uh, really lost for other reasons, more locally controlled. Can I have the next slide? So these include a variety of different uh, problems that reefs face, toxic materials, plastics, and nutrients. When they get into water surrounding the reefs can result in smothering by algae and, and the death of corals. Next slide. Agriculture and deforestation result in uh, runoff onto uh, reefs, again, destroying water quality and, inc and increasing coral mortality. Next slide. Uh, we have invasive species, which uh, are often uh, come from shipping. This can disrupt food webs and kill coral reef species. We have a major problem with this in the Caribbean associated with lionfish, but they are not the only invaders. And then finally, uh, Excessive fishing, yes, can I have that slide? Excessive fishing um, and destructive fishing disrupts reefs functioning again by promoting uh, the growth of seaweeds and also directly killing corals themselves. So many reefs have already been lost and the reefs and the reasons are um, diverse. Fortunately, and I think this is an important part of what this paper is about, is that there are solutions. Uh, and they come in three forms. Can I have the next slide? Which we call pillars, the three pillars for action, which is gonna be the focus of the rest of the uh, remarks today. The first uh, are global actions. As I mentioned, we, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are causing enormous mortality on reefs. And so reducing these emissions is absolutely critical. Uh, if we do not uh, reduce emissions, reefs as we know them, uh, even today in their diminished state will be gone uh, by the end of the century. But as I noted, that's not the only thing that kills reefs. Uh, we also have to manage local activities. We have to manage fisheries better, uh, reduce pollution. And in doing, and doing this requires supporting local communities 
who sit on the front line, the front line of coral reefs and therefore their health. And then finally, whoops, can I go back one? We need to jumpstart recovery by investing in restoration and solutions research. And that's because we can't simply wait for the surviving reefs now to recover. We really need uh, to help reefs uh, recover more quickly in the years ahead. And so I'd like to say just a few words about these individual pillars. Uh, next slide. So pillar one, again, is to reduce global climate change threats. Now we need to do this because keeping uh, temperatures below 1.5 degrees centigrade will dramatically reduce coral reef losses this century. It means the difference between say uh, almost no living coral left to somewhere between uh, as perhaps as many as 70% of corals uh, death, but still 30% remaining. There's a big difference between 30% and almost no, no coral reefs living. Now there are a number of examples of success. And one of the things this paper does is point out not only the problems and solutions, but the examples where things are going uh, in the right direction. The growing use of renewable energy, the growing electrification of our economy, and uh, carbon sequestration are all uh, efforts that are happening around the world and are good examples of what we need to do more of. And then of course there are innovations as well. These include the innovations that have dramatically reduced the costs of renewable energy, for example, the really very strong uh, uh, reduction in costs of solar and wind energy, energy around the world. And also innovative financing mechanisms uh, such as carbon markets, uh, debts for nature swaps and other such uh, financial mechanisms. And you see here on the right, an example of a, a carbon sequestration project in Kenya, which won the UN Equator Prize, it has multiple benefits associated with the preservation of mangrove forests. Next slide. So pillar two is to improve the local conditions to build resilience. So while we are working to reduce global warming, we also must improve local conditions. And uh, this is because healthy fish communities and good water quality re not only reduce um, death just in of themselves, they actually reduce coral death associated with global warming. So it's very, very important not to neglect these local conditions while we work on the problem of greenhouse gas emissions. There are a number of examples of successes around the world involving marine protected areas and also watershed management. And there are quite a few innovations coming along, including advanced monitoring methods and remote sensing, uh, new shared governance structures, which greatly increase the ability of local communities to manage their reefs uh, and build resilience. And as I said, mentioned new financing tools. And here you see on the uh, right, an uh, example from Bonaire. It's a, their uh, national marine park uh, and the financing associated with it has, and also various important fishing regulations within the uh, park have all contributed to the fact that Bonaire has uh, among the healthiest reefs of the entire Caribbean. Next slide. And finally, pillar three, we need to invest in active restoration to enhance recovery. And this is important because we, um, it does take time, it takes substantial amount of time for climate efforts to uh, come into being. And also even local conditions take time to improve. And while we're doing this, we need to uh, use uh, active restoration to speed up the process. And an active restoration is also an opportunity to test innovations. There are a number of examples of success, including the uh, stabilization of substrates after dynamite fishing or ship grounding, and also coral nurseries are being developed around the world. And the innovations associated with restoration are some of the most active uh, arenas for scientific research that we have, we have at the moment. There's work to uh, select for more robust variants of corals, there's work on uh, treatment of disease, which remains a major problem on reefs around the world. There's the ability to cryopreserve uh, sperm to facilitate uh, advanced breeding techniques and also uh, new prop propagation te te techniques involving both uh, larval corals and also fragments. So there's a lot going on in the restoration uh, world as we speak. Next slide. So to wrap up my part of the talk, let me simply say that we need to build on existing successes. We need to invest in adaptive innovations. 
And this action this decade has, has been pointed out is absolutely essential. There is no time to waste. And so what I'd like to do now is turn the, uh, t uh, the floor over to David O'Burra and who will talk about what the policy implications of the science of coral reefs are in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening to all on the line. So, so it's now my task is to um, describe what we address in the paper in terms of the policy uh, environment for, for how can we move forward? And if, if I can have the next slide. Given the immense challenges with coral reefs, uh, one of the things that we looked at, there was a UNEP report recently that identified there are 260 or more existing policy instruments or, or mentions of coral reefs in international policy instruments. So there's a huge diversity of existing policy out there already. Um, and so do we need new policy or how do we move forward and, and really implement from that? So I'll take a moment in this slide just to we look at the policy landscape um, and looking at the big picture. Um, so because the challenges that Corey's face are so large and they occur over multiple years. So, and at this point in time, a decadal uh, perspective is very important. That's, that's in, in the title of the paper. You know, we're just starting into the decade when the Convention on Biological Diversity <clears throat> and the post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework is about to set new targets the next 10 to 30 years. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is about to, uh, to meet and make decisions that will really make the difference for the next decade and, and the entire future of coral reefs and the amount of warming that we may face. And then we're sitting in the decade of the, of the United Nations Agenda 2030 for delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals, a very important decade for international development and decisions to be made. From a scientific perspective, uh, reaching back into the ICRS and, the, and, and where we're speaking from, is there two very important UN decades that have started now in 2021. So the decade on ocean science for sustainability, which is right, uh, you know, front and center in what we deal with as coral scientists, and the UN decade on restoration, uh, which is the, you know, one of the pillars that we've identified. So the next slide, please. Um, and thinking at the large scale, of course, it uh, is also spatially. So the, the spatial ambit uh, of any policies need, need to be large. So most actions, of course, and decisions are made at the country level. And of course, uh, projects and actors within countries, but the challenges are larger than individual countries. And, and we need coherence across countries to be able to really make a difference. There are a number of regional entities that can really support uh, this, this level of policy development and policy implementation So the regional seas conventions and the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. Economic blocks are particularly important <clears throat> because without action on economic activities, which are driving the decline of coral reefs and of nature globally, of course, there won't be uh, much change uh, from the actions we can do in the water. And then there are many sectoral agencies in different economic sectors, such as regional fishery management organizations. A particularly important um, actor, as well as the International Coral Reef Initiative, uh, which we heard about at the beginning, of uh, which um, I think there are now 44 uh, member countries and over 95 members in total. Um, and the ICRI community is playing a very strong role, for example, in the Convention on Biological Diversity discussions right now in terms of trying to get coral reefs into the new uh, targets uh, and goals and monitoring frameworks for assessing how well we do with biodiversity conservation in the coming decade. So the next slide. Um, so to deliver on these three pillars, now we've identified these very different pillars, you know, uh, climate threats, local conditions and active restoration. We already have a very broad policy landscape uh, for coral reefs internationally and within many countries. We need policies to deliver uh, on the need for cross-cutting and integrative approaches so that all these things work together. And so we identified three asks to work across these three pillars. First one is to establish commitments. We have a lot of policies. Have we had enough uh, commitment to deliver on them in recent years? Clearly with, with uh, climate warming, as Peter Thompson mentioned at the beginning, we have not implemented to the ambition that has been stated yet to meet the Paris Agreement. And likewise with, uh, biodiversity loss and the upcoming decisions on the global biodiversity framework, we need very high ambition and commitment to deliver on that so that they, they are implemented. The second ask you can click next is to promote coherence. 
across all of these policies uh, that are developed across many different sectors, because without coherence across them, of course, they'll be less effective and we need coherence across the three pillars so that actions in any one of them do, um, you do identify the synergies and the multiple benefits that can be obtained from working across all of them. And then the third ask that we identified is to really drive innovation. And of course, innovation and restoration is one of the pillars that we identified. But we need new approaches in this brave new world that we're facing in the Anthropocene. Uh, of course, there are current solutions that do work and we need to invest in those and really make them work and make them happen and support them. We don't need new things just to have new things, but we, we will need innovations to tackle the emergency that's facing Corries currently. Next slide. And in trying to, um, you know, it's, it's a complex world ahead of us, uh, thinking across, you know, these uh, three pillars and three asks. In the paper, we identify two timescales over which actions uh, could be implemented. So thinking first of the immediate future, so this year, 2021 and 2022. Can click next, please. Um, so, of course, on the policy framework and the commitment needed in the climate change and the biodiversity COPs, uh, that's, you know, a top priority uh, for the global community over the next year. The United Nations Environment Assembly has also been mentioned. That's, that's the top governing body internationally for environmental decisions. But we need enabling mechanisms uh, to be put in place. We have an example stated as the Global Coral Reef Fund, uh, which has been contributed to both governments and private sources to really support innovations in coral reefs. And then other political mechanisms, such as the G7 and G20 groups of countries, but there are many others that can really need to, um, to take on board these, this message and to establish commitments across these all these uh, policy levels. In terms of coherence, We've identified in the next year or two, the International Coral Reef Initiative can play a very strong role in coordination and bringing together efforts across countries. We want to expand membership, you know, all coral reef countries, all countries involved, uh, you know, with interest in coral reefs to really come on board and organizations and work together. Uh, the donor, government and NGO alignment is needed in terms of finance and solutions and local support so that all actors are working in synergy with one another. And then again, coming back to where we are now, the ICRS we're in now and the one to be held next year in person, this high level policy event and the paper is supposed to stimulate uh, an emerging dialogue. It, it's, not a, it's not a full stop on this question. It's supposed to start a discussion. Let's really um, look forward towards next year and then the coming decades um, to put our science into policy development around reef management and nature-based solutions. And then in terms of innovation, I already mentioned the support mechanisms really need to, to ramp up and start to deliver finance to innovations that are needed, innovation hubs, you know, people with, with new ideas that might work and they might not work. We really need to fund innovation to, to work out what's happening. And then really take the challenge of the two decades on ecosystem restoration and ocean science. And for Corries, particularly this issue of science equity and representation in the scientific community and conservation actors across all countries and cultures, uh, you know, with, with vested interests in coral reefs. And then lastly, the next slide, please. We identify how these um, three asks may play out over the coming decade, 2030. So if you can click next once more. So I already mentioned the decadal policy processes up there on the top and the need to really fully commit to these and to engage our science and our community in delivering our science towards these rather than just doing science for science's sake. There is a, a ready uh, framework and platform to use our information. So let's rise to the challenge. In terms of coherence, really strengthening local and national mechanisms. Uh, the idea that uh, change won't happen unless economic systems change and reduce drivers of decline. So nature-based economies and discussion around sustainable blue economy. I mean, this is really where it's needed. And of course, the interests and rights of indigenous communities. And then in terms of innovation from a science perspective, we need innovations in building resilience. We need innovations in how we, uh, our data transparency and how we share it um, and knowledge exchange for decision support. So we really are driving solutions at a large scale. And uh, then circular economy um, through uh, new uh, economic uh, instruments, technology and governance. And then it may seem boring, but accounting that includes the need for sustaining coral reefs and linkages to SDGs is particularly important. And the monitoring and global monitoring that we do 
needs to feed into accounting processes to really support coral reefs. So the final slide, I'll finish with this and the hand back to Christian really just sums up uh, sort of three main high level, uh, you know, calls to action. The time to act is now in reducing global climate change threats through the Paris Agreement, to improve local conditions, to build resilience uh, at all levels of government and for management and protection of reefs, then invest in active restoration so we can enhance reef recovery uh, for the challenges uh, coming ahead. So with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you, Nancy. Uh, really very, very clear. Uh, you know, Nancy uh, laying out the, the action, we need global action, local action to support local communities, jumpstarting recovery uh, by investing in, in restoration and solutions research, extremely important. And then looking at the, the policy elements of this, of establishing commitment, promoting coherence, and driving innovation that then supports those, those actions that are, are required. Um, I, I think it's very important to recognize, David, that you made the point, I think a, a very important con you know, connection point here is just to, that, you know, not only are we talking about a decade of activity, but we're tying in to the two decades you mentioned, the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Note, ocean science, sustainable development in the same line there, really linking what you're talking about in this paper from the science to policy and the importance that it plays for sustainable development and certainly sustainable development goals. And then, the, of course, the decade of restoration. You know, Nancy, you, you mentioned that very clear in terms of, uh, and some very clear examples on, on, you know, where we should be investing and thinking about some of the exciting areas that the science is pushing the boundaries. And I think, indeed, when we talk about uh, this decadal discussion, we want to put in place policies and actions and science that are going to take us beyond the 2030, you know, 2030 you know, window we're talking about. We really want to use this moment now to set in place a much longer term uh, you know, approach when it talks about you know, coral reefs. And, and the final thing I'll say, just reflecting on your, your comments now, was just um, that I think they're, they're, we're living in very unprecedented times, not only for, in terms of the state and the current trajectory of coral reefs, but also unprecedented times in terms of the political appetite for addressing issues in the environment, particularly ecosystems like you know, coral reefs. But, and I think as this paper and what you've already highlighted both David and Nancy, is that the, the, the real importance of the evidence base and the science to make sure that those decisions are being made are, are rock solid and they're you know, irrefutable and defensible when it comes to uh, people's constituencies and decisions and trade-offs they're having to make in some of those countries. Which kind of brings us to the, you know, the next point here, uh, really about trying to get some reactions to the paper for some, from, from key policy actors um, that we know are very active you know, in this space, thinking about it, their day-to-day -day existence is really thinking about um, you know, uh, you know, coral reefs and uh, different ecosystems and you know, policy responses to that. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is I'll, I'll invite a, a, you know, a few reflections from some of our, our panelists, and then we'll go to some, uh, you know, some Q&A. So please keep those questions coming. I see they're coming in. Uh, that's fantastic. Use the Q&A um, you know, function at the bottom of your screen there and keep those coming, you know, going in and adding those, those points in. We'd love to hear some responses from the audience. So what I'd like to first now is I'd like to turn to Rita Schwarzelua Zuta, who is the Parliamentary State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry of Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety. Unfortunately, uh, Rita could not be with us today, but she's offered a, a video statement. So could we please have the video? Thank you. Dear Coral Reef community, ladies and gentlemen, Germany welcomes the global efforts to highlight the importance of the protection of the world's coral reefs. Therefore, we support the International Coral Reef Symposium, which works towards building the resilience of coral reefs. A global response is required. We need to intensify our efforts to conserve coral reefs. This needs to be done in addition to ambitious climate protection measures, because we are facing a twin challenge. The climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. Both are closely interlinked. Coral reefs are a prominent example. They will disappear almost completely if we can't keep the global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. So, pursuing an ambitious climate mitigation policy is the first pillar. The second are measures to improve resilience and adaptive capacity of marine ecosystem. This includes conservation, restoration, as well as a sustainable use of marine resources all needs to be taken into account to make sufficient progress. 
Germany is strongly committed to the new biodiversity framework. It needs to set a stop sign against the loss of biodiversity, including coral reefs. And this needs a more effective and decisive implementation of ambitious biodiversity targets globally, nationally and locally. It has to be an implementation oriented framework. Coral reef ecosystems are crucial for many coastal communities as they spend food, jobs or flood protection. Therefore, local stakeholders need to work together and strengthen consistent marine protection. Local communities are incubators for innovative solutions. This calls for more local action and better local conditions as pointed out by your policy paper. Local governments play a key role. Interconnectivity and collective commitment are important. Germany agrees that innovative instruments in order to mobilize sustainable funding for coral reef conservation are necessary. Multi-stakeholder involvement can reduce the lack of capacities and equipment for many of the less developed countries, where coral reefs are essential. Our international initiative contributes to this endeavor. It is an important instrument for mitigation and adaptation projects and includes ocean conservation measures in our partner countries. One example is Coral Carib, a project which will pioneer a new strategic approach for conserving and restoring Caribbean coral reef ecosystems. There is a consensus among scientists, managers and governments that maintaining resilience of coral reef requires an integrated approach. This includes emissions reductions, traditional management as well as innovative interventions. This is great potential in further international cooperation on coral reefs. The G20 Coral Reef Research and Development Platform will help to combine a shared scientific knowledge. Coral reef science contributes to the UN decade on ocean science as well as a decade on ecosystem restoration. And Germany will certainly continue to advocate for the presence of coral reefs in international negotiations. I really acknowledge the work of the scientific community and I'm honored to support this event. Last but not least, I would like to congratulate the authors of the new policy paper, Rebuilding Coral Reefs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those remarks, uh, Parliamentary State Secretary for the Ministry of Environment in Germany. Terrific to see Germany's commitment to coral reefs and so many projects and activities around the world um, that are no doubt of interest to many of you. And in fact, some of you may be beneficiaries of engagement with the German government on that. Um, of, of course, we would be missed if we didn't bring in um, a coral reef country um, itself, um, someone who is on the front line, literally, of um, the existence of coral reefs and, and their, their economy and livelihoods interdependent on that in the Maldives. Delighted to welcome Minister Abdullah Nasir, who is the Minister of State, Environment, Climate Change and Technology for the Maldives. Uh, Minister, um, as I said, you are on the front line. You are no doubt thinking about this on a day-to-day -day basis and an issue that is of sort of key importance to you, um, but also to echo um, uh, Ambassador Thompson's you know, words in terms of uh, can't imagining uh, a world without coral reefs, refusing a future without coral reefs. And I'm sure that that echoes with you. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, and a very good, uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, I really would like to, first of all, thank uh, the uh, International Coral Reef Society uh, to taking the initiative to come up with this policy uh, dialogue and uh, uh, with the policy paper, uh, or, or together with uh, the United Nations Environment Program, uh, the future Earth Coasts, um, the International Coral Reef Initiative, the Prince Albert uh, of Monaco Foundation, the Kanas and Stoll Foundation for Climate and Environment, and uh, of course, supported by the German uh, Ministry of Environment. And th thank you everyone for, uh, for this great initiative uh, for uh, coral reefs. Um, first of all, let me say that the Maldives welcomes the policy, uh, the policy paper just presented and it's timely contribution, I would say, 
uh, for, for coral reefs at this point in time. Uh, we all know that the IPCC and the EPS um, have all both done uh, assessments, uh, scientific ass assessments that uh, tell us uh, where we are with respect to climate and biodiversity. And uh, so the science is very clear uh, for, um, for the future of coral reefs. The science is very clear for climate and science is very clear for biodiversity loss. And we need to worry about what we need to do to reverse this. Um, this paper, I especially not, is a fact-based uh, and dedicated uh, policy science uh, 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 writing, uh, which is very timely for the upcoming COPs, uh, which many of uh, my colleagues here mentioned on the climate and biodiversity COP. Uh, upcoming COPs. The paper definitely highlights and identifies areas that we can synergize and influence on the global assessments uh, that has already been carried out or ongoing uh, with respect to uh, ecosystem uh, conservation and biodiversity. The message that uh, the authors just uh, presented is very clear. Uh, that, uh, th that message uh, will only work with the global efforts uh, through the upcoming uh, negotiations and also with uh, local um, efforts. Local improvements are necessary. I mean, the local improvements are what we can do as a nation. So that, is, that, is, that has been highlighted very well. The local work uh, and the restoration work necessary in the next decade. The paper has also clearly spelled out the global dilemma really facing uh, out the uh, facing on coral reefs. And it is, um, it is not just about sea level rise. Sometimes we talk about uh, small island nations, small island nations, sea, uh, and sea level rise. But no, it's not just about uh, sea level rise and climatic threats. Uh, it's it's about um, uh, it's about reef specific, I would think, reef reef specific policies uh, based on uh, the understanding, the scientific understanding of biological and ecological char characteristics of individual reefs in their respective areas of the world, uh, and also based on their geomorphological makeup of different reefs, uh, different types of reefs too. So I think it is very important to focus. Uh, sometimes we get carried away with certain uh, areas of policy without um, uh, giving uh, attention to the areas. Uh, so I would tend to agree that there is a disconnected nature uh, in, on coral reef uh, science uh, with respect to, in, 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 to that to the policy. So we, we need to uh, bring everyone together at the same table in order to um, do in order to improve the local conditions uh, that will complement uh, the, uh, the global uh, assessments and the, the global efforts uh, that we, we need to do. And uh, it should be within, within uh, national policies, of course, uh, that we need to come up with reef specific policies uh, for, for coral reef nations. So these, uh, the, the three asks are very important. Uh, the commitments, uh, the coherence and the innovation with respect to uh, coral reefs uh, has, has been very uh, hi highlighted by the authors. Uh, I would think, I, I would take the example of um, uh, ozone depleting substances, the uh, elimination of a tough story for countries around the world. And just last week in the Maldives, we, uh, we marked, we celebrated uh, the phasing out of um, uh, hydrofluorocarbons, you know, it's H HPMP phase out management plan. And this has been, this is the kind of commitment, this is the kind of global political commitment that we need uh, to make change. Uh, so uh, I, I, I take note, I, I, I think uh, that it is possible to do this in the upcoming COPs. And uh, I think uh, we all have a responsibility uh, to, to make sure that we, uh, we, uh, we work through uh, the climate, um, uh, commitments and also the biodiversity conservation commitments uh, and, and also uh, with respect to achieving the sustainable development goals. I think we can do this. Um, so, but, and also with respect, we have, we've talked about innovation in, in the uh, paper. And uh, I think we need to uh, find better strategies uh, innovative financing mechanisms. We've uh, also talked about the uh, availability of uh, funds through the uh, the uh, the uh, global fund for coral reefs, for example. Uh, and we also uh, should not forget the private sector. In the Maldives, the private sector plays uh, a role in uh, developing um, world-class resorts on coral reefs. 
and uh, they they have responsibility i think uh, to uh, work with uh, respective governments uh, to to uh, conserve to invest in conservation i mean there, there should be investing on conservation the island the islands that they develop the reefs that they develop should be should be considered investments on conservation and if you can do this through capital accounting and uh, uh, and, and natural capital accounting uh, principles uh, if you can apply this uh, to coral reefs i think that will be uh, that will be uh, that will work really well for uh, coral reef conservation in the next 10 years uh, which is which is a new thing of course uh, but if we can do that uh, uh, we, we can we can achieve a lot. The Maldives has always been um, at the center of uh, coral reef conservation. We are we have been a member of the ICRI uh, from 1995. We've been part of the global coral reef monitoring network. Uh, we have also acted at the South Asia hub for um, for uh, the, the 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 regional coral reef monitoring network. So we have we have worked with uh, many of our colleagues in the region and uh, also around the world on uh, protecting species. Uh, we have protected corals above all. We have pr protected corals. We've also protected parrotfish. Uh, we, we strongly believe that the grazers uh, of uh, and keeping the coral reefs clean of algae, the parrotfish should be protected. So last year, the government has decided to protect all types of parrotfish altogether. And I think this is the kind of thing, these are the kind of policy inputs that locally we can do in order to keep coral reefs in good health so that they can recover uh, and, and, and so that we can do a better job in, in doing that. So we, 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 have, uh, we can only thrive as a coral reef uh, nation uh, with respect to good policies, uh, with uh, established science, you know, and uh, I, th I think the reef-dependent small island developing states, the cities, have um, have uh, prioritized uh, coral reef management, and uh, they they need to do uh, a lot of work to get the necessary attention. So, if coral reef-dependent nations uh, can work together uh, without the need for uh, uh, conventional regional uh, uh, regional um, groupings. I think we can we can work together to um, to develop policies better. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you uh, so much for that, Minister, and um, some very important points that I'm sure everyone was furiously taking notes on. Um, and really, this are almost issuing a challenge to those community on the line of, you know, the message is clear, but this is going to require global and local efforts to address some of these commitments under climate biodiversity and the sustainable development goals. Um, and, and you, Minister, you also raised a very important point about finance and, and really thinking about those innovative finance mechanisms that are going to have to be deployed to support a number of those actions and areas and commitments. And so we, you know, and there, and there certainly indeed not just shouldn't rely on the shoulders of, of government, but also indeed the private sector as well has a role to play um, in, in thinking about that. And I think the notion that if we effectively protect it, we can sustainably produce from it and equitably prosper. And some very important you know, dimensions uh, there. Um, I, I think you also you know, raised a bit of a challenge to uh, those on the line as well. There's still a disconnect between the science and policy for coral reefs. That may come as a great surprise to many on the line, despite decades of efforts that colleagues on the line have placed, um, we're still not there yet. And so this is our opportunity for a real push with people like yourself, sir, that are in government and have a willingness to really receive some of the science. And so we're delighted um, that you're thinking that way, especially some of your national reef policies are critically important. Um, again, so thank you for, for those, those uh, excellent remarks. I'd like to now turn to uh, Leticia Carvalho, who is the head of Marine and Freshwater Branch of the UN Environment Program. Uh, Leticia, um, you've heard, We've heard uh, many times during this session, uh, the UN Environment Program mentioned, um, you spend a good day of your job engaging with different countries and stakeholders and, and really coming uh, and pushing this agenda. And I know coral reefs are, are near and dear to your heart. So we'd love some reflections from you, from perhaps the United Nations Environment Program side of things on uh, what you've heard so far and really the importance of science, uh, coral reef science as it plays to an informing policy. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, and uh, thank you for inviting me to all the organizers. And as I am speaking from the Global Fault, uh, also greetings from Chile and Nairobi. So making peace with nature is the planetary defining task of the 21st century, as uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson just mentioned in, in his introductory remarks. And the ocean uh, defines our blue planet as its largest ecosystem. And in many ways, uh, corals, reefs embody the gravity of the triple environmental emergencies 
many times mentioned here. They are extraordinarily vulnerable to climate change. They are highly biodiverse, but also at high risk of the species extinctions. Uh, they are highly impacted by land-based sources of pollution around the world. Also, I must say, beyond the shallow waters, deep sea corals are at high risk of offshore uh, minerals, uh, exploitation, trawling, and the impact from the laying of cables and te telecommunications links. Coral reefs are at the front line of our interlinked, and by the way, self-inflicted planetary crisis. So environmental decline is eroding pro progresses towards uh, the sustainable development goals. And as we've heard uh, from previous reports, SDG 14, uh, 14 life below water is being neglected. By some measures, uh, SDG 14 is the last or the least important uh, of uh, all goals related to the leadership priorities. We must revert this trend. And um, the coral reef community is calling out for solutions. And the policy report produced by the International Coral Reef Society, which, which UNAP is proud to support and review, outlines some, some of the key actions that we need to take to save coral reefs uh, and ultimately ourselves. And I will not go again to repeat what uh, uh, many before me already said, but it's, it's really uh, uh, important because to reduce uh, the global climate threats, to improving local conditions by increasing uh, the coral reef resilience and the investments in restoration based in the science, uh, in the last science evidence. And UNAP agrees with these approaches and further flags the interlinkages between our environment and development changes, challenges and the roles of all parts of society need to play in the transformations needed for a sustainable future. UNEP also calls for and support countries to deliver on ambitions and coordinated action by uh, governments, business, businesses, and people around the world uh, in order to prevent and reverse the worst impacts of the environmental decline. And this includes uh, actually rapidly transforming key systems, including energy, water, food, and so that our use of the land and oceans to become sustainable. Also transforming social and economic systems means improving our relationship with nature overall, understanding its value and putting the value at the heart of our decision-making. And uh, it's clear us interrelated environmental emergencies must be addressed together. As Minister Abdullah just said, valuing the tropical people's livelihoods in the transformation course. And uh, human knowledge, ingenuity, technology, and cooperation can transform societies and economies and secure a sustainable future. And as Christian, as you mentioned in the beginning of this dialogue, uh, we have some good news. And one of these good news, as uh, we know, is uh, we know more than we did a decade ago. And we have the roadmaps to the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, and the upcoming post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. And we need to build the political will to meet these goals. And the report is quite fortunate uh, also to identify that we know more. Uh, we saw the mention that the indigenous community, the indigenous and traditional knowledge of on coral reefs is now actually building upon or actually join hands with the more recent uh, knowledge from the Western coral reef science and the major focus now is looking for solutions. And in this regard, examples of scientific advancements and policy successes abound. And the UN and decades on ocean science for sustainable development and ecosystem restoration, as many times mentioned here, could not have come at a more relevant moment in history as we seek to make peace with nature. And what does it mean in one shot that is aiming to add in the findings of the report, it means to attract meaningful investment in a blue recovery by defining and communicating the opportunities inherent in growing a sustainable blue economy. This would be a model for sustainable economic progress, biodiversity conservation, and promotes human well being and livelihoods. And it's quite important to mention that the tropical coral reefs communities are major blue economies and investments and support to their economies can enable the necessary transformation pathway. So as I conclude, let us join hands to leverage the opportunity inherent in this uh, two decades, the ecosystem restoration and the science for sustainability. 
And let's join hands in the upcoming global decision-making processes that CDB, UN, FCCC, WTO, and UNER, without forget, of course, the regional CSMEAs and the schemes of regional governance. With that, I revert back to you, Christine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Atisha. Uh, great comments, really making peace with nature, you know, putting the context of Coral Reefs in the blue recovery. I think certainly over the last 18 months, it's shown us all the, uh, once again, the, you know, more globally, the importance of our relationship with nature and bring that really to the forefront um, and really joining hands, that collaboration, working together, you know, strength in numbers is what we're really going to need to rise to this challenge. Some terrific comments that are coming up in the, the in the chat. Uh, if you want them, uh, great if you could pull those into the into the Q and A so that uh, everyone can see them. Uh, as I told it, not everyone can see what's happening in in the in the, uh, in the chat. Um, you know, keep those you know keep those coming. We of course we're not going to get to all of them, but there's some terrific ideas and comments and you know food for thought on some of the perspectives that no doubt the authors and some will be you know considering um, uh, as taken away from uh, this session that we have today. Um, and finally, and by no means least, I wanna to turn to David Souter. Uh, he is the Chief Research Officer of the Australian Institute of Marine Science and the Global Coordinator for the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network or GCRMN. Uh, David, um, I know that you're hard at work at, uh, at thinking about and developing uh, a new status of the world's coral reefs um, through GCRMN and all your uh, your networks. Um, really, you know, the importance of science and, and the role of, of shaping policy and, and governments. And I guess would love your reflections because this is something that's, you know, again, at the heart of what you are involved with and what you're doing as far as GCRMN is concerned and, and love your thoughts and reactions on that. Over to you. Thanks very much, Christian. And thank you to the ICRS, to Nancy, David, and all the other authors for the preparation of this very important paper. Um, it's a magnificent contribution to the dialogue um, to, to save coral reefs. Um, my first reflections on, on reading the paper were that, that the three pillars in particular were very much aligned to, to Australia's uh, Reef 2050 long-term sustainability plan for, for the Great Barrier Reef. But the next thing that struck me was the the robustness of the science that that uh, is behind this paper, and that, given that we are talking about um, science to policy, is is absolutely critical to this this discussion. Um, we know from from recent projections that even if we, as a global community, are able to bring climate emissions under control, there's an amount of uh, of continued warming that will be unavoidable, and. As the paper states, that is, uh, you know, means that it would be absolutely paramount to maintain uh, and improve conventional management to uh, control local pressures uh, while we develop new interventions to, to bolster reef resilience going forwards. With regards to the, the key asks, I thought that they were very well formulated and, and absolutely essential. Um, from the perspective of a, of a science agency like the Australian Institute of Marine Science and uh, the GCRMN, drive, of the three R's, driving innovation, I thought was the, the most relevant, although I think we can all agree that the principle of promoting coherence is just applicable, just as applicable in science and innovation. Um, when we're tackling challenges as complex as large scale, uh, and complex as, as arresting the decline of global coral reefs. Greater coordination, collaboration and communications at all levels, whether that be local, regional or global, um, will be absolutely essential to avoid duplication, competition and ensure efficient and cost effective use of resources. Innovation to arrest the decline of coral reefs and to support the rebuilding of coral reefs is required in many areas, as uh, David and Nancy pointed out in their presentation. But I think it's worth highlighting two. Um, the first that I'd like to concentrate on, not surprisingly, is innovation and monitoring. Monitoring is an absolutely critical element at both ends of the science to management and policy pipeline. At one end, monitoring informs uh, or provides a trigger for management action. At the other end, it tells you whether your management intervention is actually working and whether you can uh, use that information to refine your management approach. Standard adaptive management cycle. 
as uh, Christian mentioned in, in his intro, the GCRAN is about to release the next edition of the, the Status of Coral Reefs of the World report. This will be the first report since 2000, first global report since 2008. And importantly, it's the first GCRMN report or global report that's based on the quantitative analysis of a global data set, which has been built from contributions of literally hundreds of scientists and organisations from 73 different reef bearing countries around the world. One of the significant challenges we faced in, in uh, producing this coherent data set was the huge variation in the way people around the world monitored coral reefs. What they measured, some programs measured things in infinite detail, others focused on uh, quite specific um, indicator species, if you like. How they measured them, whether it be with photos, line intercept transects, underwater visual surveys, et cetera, or whether they chose fixed, repeated surveys at fixed sites or randomly chosen sites or how frequently they measured coral reefs, whether it be annually, biannually, or, or simply opportunistically. This variation made it very, very difficult to produce a, or aggregate data from different programs to produce a, a globally coherent data set to compare apples with apples. No doubt much of this variation uh, is a consequence of the different priorities, capability and capacity available uh, and available resources, but all of these challenge offers opportunities where we can innovate to enhance the contribution of monitoring to management policy development. For example, can we use technology to uh, circumvent capability and capacity gaps to Im improve standardization and rate of data collection? Perhaps we can even go a step further and develop and introduce autonomous platforms to collect coral reef data. Maybe even a step further where we can develop protocols for processing and analyzing and reporting reef monitoring data with the help of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, much as uh, the Reef Cloud project does, which is funded um, by the Australian government and implemented by AIMS uh, and rolled out in the Pacific. And perhaps the next and maybe the biggest step is, could we build on large scale monitoring initiatives like the GCRMN, like ReefCheck, like Reef Cloud and, and WCS's Mermaid project, where we can uh, make monitoring data more fair, that is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. If we're able to do one of these things that would be a giant step forward if we could do all of these things it would absolutely improve the robustness accessibility and interoperability and timeliness of monitoring data for management and policy it would enable the development of standardized indicators for reef condition and resilience across various parts of the ecosystem such as those recommended by ICRI to the post 2020 um, global biodiversity framework this would certainly improve comparability between reefs or regions and provide early warning of significant changes and invite, enable the evaluation of different uh, of the effectiveness of different management interventions. It would also importantly, as we move forward, enable the development of powerful predictive ecological models, um, which would enable us to test the performance of potential management options under different scenarios for good decision making. Innovations such as this are absolutely essential for the future of, the coral, of coral reefs and also achieving the vision of the UN decade um, of ocean science for sustainable development. Just quickly, the second innovation area I'd just like to touch on is in the area of reef management and importantly, delivering science into uh, reef management. The three Pillars of action that the paper recognises uh, focus on the need to Im improve uh, local conditions for enhanced protection and the need to invest in, in, in restoration science and active reef restoration. These pillars offer ample opportunity for, for innovation. The paper recognises um, that we need to enhance adaptation to restore reefs uh, in many areas. And this is going to require a globally coordinated effort, um, which will be utterly multidisciplinary involving scientists and managers and engineers and, and technologists. Um, 
there are several initiatives underway, some of them already mentioned, such as the, uh, the G20 Global Coral Reef R&D platform, uh, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs under the banner of ICRI, and indeed the Australian Government funded Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, which is also focused on three pillars, um, namely to protect coral reefs uh, from rising sea temperatures using innovative technologies such as uh, shading and, and cloud brightening, helping coral reefs to adapt um, through selective breeding or conditioning or the manipulation of the microbiome and active restoration through large scale coral propagation, industrial aquaculture and the like. These innovations and expanding the, pro, the pipeline of robust science into management policy development uh, will be critical for coral reefs um, and also achieving the aspirations of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So thanks for my reflections, Christian. Thanks. You. Yeah, thanks so much for that, um, David. Great to have your, uh, your reflections and thoughts there. You know, some key moments, you know, some important points you're making there about monitoring. And I know everyone's will be keen to, to look at that report uh, later this year. Um, but also, you know, you can't have all this, you know, terrific science to inform policy if you can't have the monitoring to inform that. Um, and I think that is going to be a critical component, you know, you know to this going forward. Um, what I'd like to do now is, you know, we're, as, as always, um, with these sorts of things, we're, we're running out of time. And there have been some terrific questions. Um, I know that, that, that people on the line have started to answer them. Some people are noting them down to follow up with you and, uh, and you know, we'll you know, try to bring that into the, you know, into the discussion and, and some of your further discussions going forward. Um, what I wanna do very briefly is I think we'd be remiss in all this if we didn't bring in the president of the ICRS, Andrea Gotoli, who um, is also one of the authors of the paper. And Andrea, I know that you've been listening intently um, you know, to some of those reflections on the, on the policy makers and those involved in policy and some of the ideas there. Um, you were you know, instrumental in, in you know, getting this report off the ground through ICRS. I, can you offer just very briefly, because I want to go to a couple of questions to the panelists that have come up here that I think are really interesting and relevant here. Um, could you perhaps give us some reflections on, you know, why is this work so important for coral reefs at this time? I mean, you know, what are the what are the sort of the key things that you're sort of hope would come out of this um, as far as you're concerned? Andrea, over to you. Thank you, Christian. Um, the work is really important because we are running out of time to prevent irreversible damage. We understand the problem. We know what the solutions are. The science is very clear. Coral reef decline is caused by climate change stress, followed closely by local stressors like pollution and overfishing. We also know from scientific research what works to protect, preserve, and restore coral reefs. Reduce ocean warming and acidification, increase marine protected areas and management at local to regional scales, and actively restore reefs. And David gave, uh, David Suter gave a really good summary of a lot of the innovations and active engagement activities that we do. But all of this is undermined if we don't simultaneously and aggressively address climate change mitigation. All three approaches are critical to implementing, are critical to implement simultaneously and immediately. Current models show that 10 to 30% of reefs will persist this century if temperature rise is limited to one and a half degrees Celsius, but only 1% will remain if increases reach two degrees Celsius by the end of this century. This is a crisis for reefs and for people. Not only do reefs protect coastlines from damage and flooding, provide food for millions of people, and have an estimated global annual economic value of $10 trillion, Reefs are vital ecosystems that support over 30% of marine species. Each year that we do not act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate climate change, every year that we do not improve local conditions to build reef resilience, every year that we do not invest in active reef restoration and innovation, decreases the percentage of reefs that will survive this century and undermines all of our efforts to protect and rehabilitate coral reefs through local interventions. We have no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Andrea. Some very important words there. No time to waste, the clock is ticking. Um, and I think that's really clear that comes out of this. I wanna take a couple of questions that have come up, I think are very interesting um, in the Q&A here. And maybe if I could direct the first one to you, Nancy. Um, the first one comes from Denise Alcantara, who is a researcher, freelance journalist um, based in the Philippines. And she says, 
Most of the reefs in the Philippines are fringing reefs, which means our reefs are heavily impacted by anthropogenic stressors. Plus the country is regularly hit by multiple strong typhoons every year. Because of many international organizations and research institutes that promote active reef restoration, there are local government units and NGOs in the country that conduct restoration uh, projects as band-aid solutions. Since these restoration projects look great on social media. Mm, very interesting point. Uh, do you think reef restoration is a good use of taxpayers' money in the Philippines? And then if not, how do you think local coral reef scientists here in the Philippines can fight these PR-friendly reef restoration programs? Bit of a double-barreled one there. It's a bit of a hot potato, but Nancy, do you, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, reef restoration only makes sense in the context of addressing climate change and fixing the things that killed locally killed corals to begin with. So planting corals in a place where corals have died uh, without addressing the reasons the corals died previously will do no good. On the other hand, reef restoration has a really important role to play when those local conditions have been addressed. Or sometimes it's not even, a, it's a, a more acute stress like a, the damage caused by an individual explosion of dynamite fishing or ship grounding, in which case the local conditions are, the, the conditions that cause the corals to die um, are, no longer, uh, are no longer prevalent. So, so it really, I, I would never, and I, there's a lot of, I, I, I hear in your question, this tension between doing things as band-aids versus doing things that actually make a difference. And I think it's really important to support coral restoration efforts where they make a difference and then do your best to guide um, coral reef restorations, which are not effective in a way they'll be more productive. Because obviously there's, not only is there no time to waste, there's no money to waste. So we really need to uh, work on restoration efforts in a way that makes sense and work. And there are many restoration efforts around the world that are working in the right direction. So I would, I don't know your situation in the Philippines well enough to know in detail what you're referring to, but I think it's important to work to improve restoration rather than throwing the so-called baby out with the bathwater and say all restoration is a waste of time. Restoration buys important time. And it, as I mentioned also, it's, um, it's a really important testing ground for other kinds of uh, innovations in terms of, for example, uh, controlled breeding uh, and uh, and various propagation techniques. So it's a it's useful in and of itself, and also as a form of scientific research. Uh, thanks, Nancy. Maybe I can take moderator's privilege and just ask ask a follow up in terms of, uh, I mean, the question that goes around my head listening to this issue of, of restoration, uh, especially in you know in past symposiums. I mean, restoration was not in the main domain. You know, it was on the I was on the periphery, and everyone thought it was an interesting thing, but it would never enter in the main domain. And now it's really shifting away from that and bringing it into the main domain. But one of the challenges is, I mean, are you feeling confident that this can happen at the scale that's required? Uh, I am confident that we can make it happen at the scale required. It is currently not happening at the scale as required. And if you had to ask me, you know, one of what is one of the biggest challenges, actually this is true for all the pillars, is scale. Yeah. So scale in terms of addressing climate change, scale in terms of addressing local conditions and scale in terms of a restoration. But mm. so a focus on scale and efficiency and how to do this in, in a big way really matters. There are examples in marine restoration uh, where scale had, the problems of scale have been addressed. For example, seagrass restoration on the East Coast of the United States, there's some recent reports of really large scale restoration efforts. So I think it's important not to say, it's just, it'll never work, it's always too small. Because the whole idea of restoration really is not to replant every single coral that's died, it's to sort of jumpstart the recovery process so the corals themselves can then take it from there. Corals are pretty good at regrowing if you give them the right conditions. Yeah, absolutely, and that 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 is a you know is a great is a great point there. Um, I, I want to just there's a, there's a question here that's come up, and maybe I can address this to you, Andrea. Um, this uh, Samu Chan has has raised this issue about research equity, and you know perhaps the the, the idea is that the, on looking at the author list doesn't look very equitable from from his perspective. Um, but the but the more important point here is you know you know the role of you know if we want to have this real strong interface between science and policy. Um, how can we move towards you know, having voices of people you know, 
within the, you know, Samuel says here, the Indo-Pacific, but, you know, the global South, you know, be more represented in, in, in this dialogue. That is certainly something that the International Coral Reef Society and all of the organizations that are involved in the science to policy paper are acutely aware of. We recognize the need to bring in more voices, to engage in a larger discussion so that we are making decisions and integrating information across this broad spectrum of coral reefs that cover the globe. Um, we have started making strides in that direction. Certainly the International Coral Reef Society is actively working toward uh, increasing diversity and inclusion. Um, this, is by, this is a long road. Uh, we've come a long way. We're doing much better than we did, but we still have a lot more work to do from that perspective. Um, as far as the author list goes here, we actually did um, try, I shouldn't say try, we actually did incorporate quite a few voices. It may not be immediately apparent by reading the list, but we did actually um, conscientiously make efforts to include as large of an inclusive list as possible at this time. And we continually strive to broaden that inclusion uh, going forward. That's, that's, that's great. And, and, and good, really great to know that the ICRS is making you know, great strides at, at really trying to um, you know, promote an inclusive agenda and bring other, those other voices into them. Um, because I think as Nancy pointed out, you know, it's going to be local communities that are going to be really critical for um, you know taking this um, taking this forward. Um, I wonder if I could take perhaps one final question here, and and um, I'm going to turn to uh, David Obura on this. Um, this this came from an anonymous attendee, um, but was kind of moved up the list here. And and really, um, this this question here is is about that you know um, a huge amount being done in parts of the world to drive transition to green low uh, emissions in the world. Um, large part coming from industry more than government, um, but one looks at various parts of the tropics with a strong dependence on reefs. One sees is the massive coral and tourist infrastructure development inherently what comes with is more and more tourist air travel. Okay, so there's that, you know, you, you, know, you want to have more money coming in on your tourism, but that's going to rely on, um, and people want to come to see coral reefs and love them almost to death, but you're, by doing that, it's the air travel that's, that, that's coming in. And I think uh, you know, how, how does one address these divergent goals and, and challenges? I know, you know, you're really thinking about this, um, David, and in, in, you know, certainly perspective of the Western Indian Ocean of, you know, how do you reconcile, you know, the need for protection and conservation and restoration, while at the same time, you know, local communities and economies are dependent, you know, on those, you know, on those reefs. And, and maybe you could offer just some of your perspectives and thoughts on, on, on this very important issue. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Yeah, that is a very difficult question to answer. And I'd certainly say that there's so there's no easy solutions. There's just difficult uh, solutions, and it's really about finding a balance between many different um, pressures. It's something we're working on quite strongly, actually, with Future Earth as one of the sponsors of this event, and the Earth Commission. There is how do you really bring down these drivers of decline, which is so driven by um, e economies, basically, and energy consumption. And it's really that, you know, we need to have greater equity um, across the planet. So we do need to bring up incomes uh, and economies in, in those places that, that are dependent on tourism around coral reefs, for example. There will be air travel to them. But how do we bring down all the other uh, polluting uh, aspects, I guess, of, of high income lifestyles around the planet and really go to efficient uh, energy solutions? really make air travel much more uh, environmentally friendly than it is now. And I think that's part of the innovation solution that we bring up. So we need to face these challenges head on and really identify uh, where the, you know, where the changes have to come from and those, those parts of global society to really make the commitments and to go for the coherence that we call for in this paper to act now. Yeah, and that, that's a very important point, David, just not thinking about sort of in the water and this, this attendee here, it's not the in the water, um, uh, uh, innovation is required. There's a whole other you know, sort of sectors around it that's going to be required to mobilize that innovation. I think that's important for people to get their, their heads around. Uh, Minister Nasir, can I just come to you? I see, Letitia, you've got your hand up. We're, we're running out of time, but I'd be really remiss if I didn't come to you on this issue of reconciling uh, the importance of, of coral reefs that plays you know, in your economy, and that is largely driven by you know, the tourism sector and, you know, and that need. I, I mean, I'm sure this comes up in conversation all the time and maybe just very briefly, if you have some sort of final reflections on that. 
Yes, thank you. Um, well, the Maldives depends entirely on its coral reefs for for uh, for tourism, you know, and and fisheries, and so tourism is very important uh, for the Maldives. But a uh, lot of people sometimes criticize that tourism is also very bad for coral reefs, you know. But but I think uh, over time, over the past. Um, 40, 40, 40 years of tourism development in the Maldives, we have come to, um, we, we have been very fortunate enough to assign specific reefs uh, to be developed as, as uh, hotels. And um, we have also, um, uh, we, we have also worked with the, uh, the tourism community so that they are very, uh, some, some of the resorts are very committed for, um, for conservation. And so I think, I think that's a good thing, you know, to, you, you, you have, uh, your income and livelihoods uh, are tied into uh, conservation, you know, and, and resorts do sometimes um, the, the community uh, can do. And, and I think there's more work to do actually, uh, working with coral reefs and finding investment through the, um, to, through the visitors uh, um, to, to, to um, invest on coral reefs. Fantastic. So demand-driven innovation, you know, from the countries and tourists, very important um, there. Leticia, I'm going to give you the, the final word from our panel before I wrap things up, if you could be really brief as we're, we're getting close to time here. Thank you very much, Christian. A very exciting discussion, and I know we are running out of time. So very quickly, just to reflect that it sounds, uh, listening from all the panelists, that we will not have a silver bullet. We need a group uh, of different innovations uh, to leverage them and to scale up them, uh, considering different circumstances and needs. I think this is quite clear in terms of policy making. And allow me just, I will not be able to conclude this panel without pick upon one particular innovation that I think it's quite interesting. And UNAP is actually at the basis of the development of this one. That is actually the blue carbon accountability and marketing. We know despite all the challenges to make this a reality, uh, we have been supporting a group of projects that are actually bringing some, some additional, uh, let's see, experiences and tools in order to make uh, more this nascent voluntary markets for trading of blue carbon and credit is uh, uh, really to shift towards the conservation, uh, uh, a more prominent, let's see, uh, possibility and innovation. So I'm quite keen to uh, to further work in this regard to make one groups and seagrasses, uh, uh, UNAP is actually looking into this direction, uh, more prominent in the, in the blue carbon, in the carbon market uh, overall. And uh, the Global Trust Fund, uh, coral reefs that I think were, uh, was, was actually mentioned a couple of times in this conversation is also a very, very uh, relevant uh, inst and instrumental uh, looking ahead. That's a so very thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very important words to end on there and very inspirational. Maybe if one of my colleagues could put the, if you're not familiar with it, put the link to the Coral Reef Trust Fund, um, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs that's being established. Um, you know, those who may not be familiar with interested to see the instrument. I think it's very, very important. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues, um, it's uh, been a really fascinating session um, and a, very thought provoking. And I uh, it, it you know fills me with with more optimism than I expected to come away from this session. To be honest with you, um, you know the appetite for innovation and and driving this forward and the three asks um, that are, are kind of committing to addressing these issues. You know, building actions that are coherent um, and promoting this coherence across all policy fields and all levels of governance and sectors, and then to innovate whether this is technological, economic, or social innovation, and really drive those and thinking you know, innovatively and disruptively as we go forward and address it over the next decade uh, and beyond. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a, a start of a conversation as some of our panelists um, uh, said, and hopefully, or some would view it as a continuation, but an amplification of this conversation and driving this forward in a collective efforts. As Leticia said, there are no uh, uh, silver bullets that are um, uh, you know, our single solutions are required and we're gonna have to be collective as we, as we move together in this. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's important that, um, that we you know, pick this up perhaps next year at the uh, International Coral Symposium, the 15th version of the International Coral Symposium in Bremen in July, 2022. And this will be a, a, a continuation in sort of seeing what has worked and what hasn't over the last year in the science and policy dialogue and uh, evaluate how the paper has been taken up. We hope that all of you on the line will go out and use that um, and, uh, and really drive some of the important decisions that are, that are being made. Um, as I said, this paper will be available um, and accessible through the ICRS website at coralreefs.org um, at the end of this session. So you'll be able to download that and really dig in uh, into that. 
Um, I'd really like to thank all of our panelists, the organizers, um, and everyone for uh, your involvement today and taking your precious time to participate uh, in the session. And I particularly like to thank a lot of friends and colleagues. I had a little look through the participant list and some very old friends and colleagues here I haven't seen in many years uh, joining in and, and really great to see you participating and, and hope that our paths will cross in the not too distant future as you know, um, conditions hopefully get better in all of the places that we live um, at the moment. So with that, um, I thank you from, from my perspective. And again, thank you, terrific panelists and, and the great um, exciting session we had here today. Uh, what I wanna do now is I wanna hand over to uh, Sebastian Ferse, who is the executive director of the Future Earth Coast International Project Office who will be moderating the press conference segment of this event. And of course, all of you are welcome to stay. And of course, um, if you haven't seen already, Sebastian is also one of the authors on the paper as well. So with that, I hand over to you, Sebastian. Thank you very much indeed, Christian, and to all panelists and to the audience for asking um, very uh, important uh, questions. And I'm sorry that we didn't have time to answer all of them, but we kept note of all the questions and we'll try to follow up. Um, after the, the event has ended. So at this point, um, we would like to open the floor to representatives of the press um, who had been invited to attend to ask a question to the, um, to the panelists, particularly the authors of the um, paper. Um, so how we're gonna do this is um, to use the chat function if you uh, have a question that you would like to ask uh, in person. So then I ask you to please um, identify yourself, which, uh, which organization you come from and whom of the panelists you would like to address your question to. Um, and then I'll uh, give you the right to speak. So we have 13, uh, 13 minutes for the press conference. And I see there is one question about the recording of the press conference. This will not be part of the, um, uh, of the recording that will be made available afterwards. So I'll take a look at the chat. Don't see any additional questions at the moment there. But as we still have a number of attendees here, um, we still have the, the time where we can use the time um, for, the, um, for the remaining authors of the paper. If you would like to, you saw the questions that were asked, if you would like to address some of these, um, unless we get additional questions from the press, we can still use the time, uh, I guess, to discuss some of the questions that have been raised. I don't know, Christian, how we do that, because um, there are a couple of questions around locally managed marine areas, I think, that would be worth talking about. Sure. Okay. So I would just need to ask one of the uh, one of the other assistants in the background to um, spot the questions for me, because I'm switching roles now. Um, but I think, yes, there have been a, a couple of questions on the role of the involvement of local communities and um, uh, locally managed areas. So if we take those, David, if you want to go ahead and answer that point as sure. you just brought it up. Sure, I'll just introduce the context a bit. There's a, a couple of questions from Sibylla Reedmiller mentioning the, the contribution of locally managed marine areas. So where there's co-management with local communities as opposed to central government control. Uh, also, she mentioned marine privately protected areas as a solution and then also marine conservation agreements as a mechanism. Um, and I think pointing to the need for ramping up um, area under effective protection, uh, which is a primary pillar of the new global biodiversity framework that's coming up. And I think there's very strong recognition that um, going beyond uh, government to centrally controlled areas is a very important um, platform to use that local stakeholders uh, have the greatest uh, interest in the health of their local uh, environments and coral reefs is, is, a, is a key example of that. So I think there are a lot of innovations in the West Indian Ocean in several countries in the Pacific and much more broadly than that, than that I'm sure. IUCN has identified a new sort of category called the other effective conservation measures that these all might fall under and a process to be able to show which techniques do uh, provide for effective protection and conservation. 
many of them often using indigenous or local uh, sustainable use techniques that are, that are well managed. So I think this will be increasingly important. And, and from the observations that I make personally around the new biodiversity framework coming up is that these will be a large part of the solution in moving forward. So I think investment in them, getting them to work financially is very important. We're trying to work out how to do that in East Africa as well. It's very challenging to financially support many uh, sort of locally managed marine areas, but working out how we can do that from relevant sustainable finance uh, channels is, is a big part of that puzzle as well. So thanks. Thanks, David. There was um, one additional uh, interesting question that was posed in the Q&A that we didn't, didn't get to address yet. Um, and I would uh, like to um, post this question to Andrea. Um, this is from coming from Arto Dahl, and it's, um, uh, he's asking some coral reef refuges, uh, refuges may be naturally protected from higher temperatures by upwelling colder water. Uh, are there any ways that localized coral reefs might be protected from acidification? No. That's the short answer, because ocean acidification is the result of a massive change in ocean chemistry. And the only real way to mitigate that is to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So as CO2 in the atmosphere increases, the amount of that, the pressure of that gas increases and more CO2 gets pushed into the ocean. It reacts chemically with the surface ocean carbonate system, and it makes the water more acidic. There are ways of doing chemical additions on very small local scales to try and change that, but it immediately rinses away with the next tide or the next tidal cycle. And so there is no way to mitigate that. We certainly have parts of the world where naturally the oceans are more acidic than others because of volcanic seeps, for example, but that's even more acidic, not less. Um, we do know that there is resilience within corals to ocean acidification. Some coral are able to calcify normally, even under acidic condition, conditions, others cannot. Um, but that's part of the sort of natural distribution in resilience and genetic capabilities within corals and species and even populations within species. But there is no, to my knowledge, sort of natural refuge from ocean acidification the way there might be for temperature in the case of upwelling, like you pointed out, or even areas with higher flow, that also um, can mitigate the effects of elevated temperature. Thanks, Andrea, for that question, uh, for, that, for that response to that question. I think that was an important uh, consideration because obviously there, uh, there is a lot of uh, talk about or consideration about which reefs to prioritize when it comes to localized conservation action. And of course the initiatives such as the 50 reefs or uh, other um, initiatives that try to identify reefs of hope that we should focus on uh, are pondering exactly these questions. Um, well, was... I, could, I could add just for a minute that um, right. the effects of temperature are much more pressing right now. Ocean acidification, while it does slow down calcification, is not killing corals right now. Heat is. And so when ocean acidification starts crossing over to the point of being a critical stress for corals is a couple decades away. But heat is an immediate stress right now. Thanks for that addition. I think that's uh, very um, important to underline that once uh, once again. Um, there is a lot of uh, discussion with several questions um, that were being asked that uh, revolve around reef restoration. Um, and uh, we did provide some responses already in the Q&A and in the, in the chat to that. Uh, we were not able to go into much detail in, uh, in our summary report on reef restoration, but there have been some uh, recent publications, including by um, by the partners in this report, uh, that provide excellent summaries. So if, if anyone uh, is interested in more details on reef restoration, please have a look at these um, at these resources. Uh, however, there's one question I would like to uh, like to bring to the panel, uh, and that was a question um, by an uh, anonymous. Um, uh, poster um, or participant. Um, 
it was uh, he was asking, should we prioritize? He or she was asking, should we prioritize reefs in certain regions, or do we need a global active restoration uh, approach? What is the role of turbid reefs in the climate change crisis? Are there any takers among the panel that feel you know, particularly compelled to answer this, Andrea? I mean, I can start, but I think Nancy and David have a lot to add to this as well. Prioritizing reefs is locally a locally made decision. So in each region, what might be a priority reef will vary depending on the needs, local needs. So what does that local community need from a reef, as well as how stressed that reef is or how much damage there is to a particular reef and, and or reef region that needs attention or protection. Um, but, you know, turbid reefs may be oases in some places, and I've done research that suggests that there may be some advantage to turbid reefs because of the particulates actually reducing incoming solar radiation, which helps protect from warming events. It also has higher um, organic, potentially higher organic matter as a source of food in the water column for corals, which could be another way that provides a local refuge. So there, there could be some advantages to turbid reefs, certainly, but again, I think it really depends on where you are and what the circumstances are. Um, Nancy and David, perhaps you have more to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. If I can add to that. So a big question, especially with climate change and moving forwards, um, is restoration to what and of what? And it's certainly true that some locations will have a much better future climate for corals and reefs than other locations will. And so focusing on those to restore uh, coral reef conditions may be the priority, but some regions will not have a good climate for reefs coming up and we've already lost reefs in, in many areas. So I think, and this is a big topic, there was a recent workshop report by the IPCC and IPBES together, uh, highlighting the need to look towards future conditions and novel environments that may emerge. And I think restoration can also look at ensuring that future, um, Future communities, uh, you know, make conditions as good as possible for for those places to evolve into into the future reefs that they might be. They might be quite different from the coral reefs that used to be there in the past, and we have to keep that in mind as as a, as a, one of the restoration sort of perspectives uh, that is used. Thanks, David. Nancy, did you want to uh, add to that? Otherwise, I have another question that relates to reef restoration projects. Okay, then I'll, I'll add, this is a question by John Ogden. Um, he says, people care about coral reefs and want to do something, obviously. This is the reason there are a proliferating number of reef restoration projects. How can these disparate global groups be integrated into a block that could pressure national and global policies on climate change and other Reef impact. Oh, I see. Minister Nasir would like to answer that question, please. Um, no, I just wanted to add what I think uh, to, uh, to to this debate of coral reef restoration. I think uh, I think it's there is a, a need to um, identify and also communicate what uh, restoration science is all about. You know. But there, there is uh, there is a belief that uh, that uh, growing corals is uh, what coral reef restoration is, uh, which is uh, very misleading. Actually, uh, coral reefs are very complex systems of not just corals, uh, and I, I I think the whole focus on corals is that because uh, because of uh, climate warming up of water, uh, corals well many branching corals especially fast growing brine corals die off and it's very visibly seen uh, and people feel the need to, um, uh, to uh, plant more um, or grow more um, branching corals, you know, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's more to than that, uh, given, given the type of reef you're, uh, you're uh, worried about and uh, given the type of environment that you're in, uh, sometimes we have seen in the Maldives, for example, uh, most of the branching corals may have grown, but all the um, all the um, uh, massive uh, corals are intact. And but the whole landscape, whole, the whole reefscape has changed, you know. But it's not as beautiful maybe as it was before. But there is certainly uh, 
life and fish and everything around. So the whole idea of restoration needs to be defined within the scientific community and understood it as uh, uh, it is all about coral reef restoration, about uh, what uh, what calcareous growth and cementation process and how uh, all the uh, different um, uh, substrates that uh, that interact with each other you know so these things need to be uh, how, the type of environment that you're talking about the type of substrate so there's a lot of slack uh, science science lacking in this whole process uh, of uh, citizen science who are interested in doing something which is very good but this at the same time uh, we need to come up with uh, come up with um, the science behind restoration I would think thank you Thank you for making that point. I think it's it's very important uh, to underline that uh, while it's it's great to see all this enthusiasm and see citizen science and involvement, uh, that these things need to be based on adequate uh, knowledge of the processes and uh, the local conditions, as you pointed out. Um, while you're still on the line, uh, I hope you don't mind, uh, Minister Nasir, if I ask you uh, another question from the chat. This is by Kai Kaczynski um, uh, from Fair Oceans here in Bremen, and he's asking do you think development standards are needed for a sustainable coral reef policy and which of these standards are most important for the idea of blue justice and securing traditional rights? Um, yes, uh, that, that is an excellent question, you know, uh, coming from a coral reef uh, country and uh, the Maldives being um, uh, heavily dependent on coral reefs, we have, uh, we have developed uh, extensively on coral reefs. Uh, I, I, I think when you develop on coral reefs, there are a number of, uh, in, in the, the number of impacts um, uh, that come about, uh, which needs to be uh, standardized and regulated. And we here in the Maldives um, do this best through uh, environmental impact assessments. You know, although we don't have um, a framework for strategic environment assessment, we have a very strong, uh, stringent um, uh, environmental impact assessment uh, before before we get into uh, any development on coral reefs. But uh, that is, uh, I, I think, if you legalize this, that is the best uh, way uh, you can stand. Uh, you can develop. Sorry, you can develop standards for uh, reef areas. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Nasir. Andrea, you've raised your hand. You would like to add? Mm -hmm. I wanted to just point out the, um, to the minister this year that methods, the science behind restoration is actually moving along very quickly. For a long time, it was struggling, but in the last decade, I feel we've made enormous progress. And there's a report coming out by a chapter of the International Coral Reef Society. It is the Coral Restoration Consortium. It'll be coming up shortly, which does provide a summary of guidelines for practitioners so that that science to application transition is there and that the what we've learned from the science can be applied locally. So that guidebook is coming. Um, and then the second, I wanted to loop back to John Odgan's um, comment about bringing together different bodies to raise our voices at a larger stage. And the International Coral Reef Society has part of its plan of action, which we have been implementing for the last two years, part of our plan of action is to do just that. And so our engagement, uh, more active engagement with ICRI, with the COP process, with the um, post 2020 CBD process is all part of bringing science of coral reefs into those discussions and creating a broader network of organizations that are all advocating for coral reefs so that our voices are enhanced, stronger, and that we get coral reefs as part of those larger international discussions that then influence climate change mitigation, influence, influence CBD decisions, influence restoration decisions. So hopefully uh, we're on the right track. We have a long way to go, but that is definitely part of the International Coral Reef Society's agenda. And I know that UNEP and all the other um, organizations that we are interacting with and ICRI also are, have the same ideas in mind. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andrea. Um, there was actually a question that just came up in the, in the Q&A regarding that. Can you already indicate the date when this report you just mentioned will be released? The CRC one? Yes. 
That I don't know, but they can reach out to Tom Moore at the CRC and his contact information is on the ICRS webpage. Excellent. Thank you, Andrea. Um, while we are on the issue of um, bringing the latest science to policymaking, there was another question by Emma Doyle that I think addresses exactly that point. Um, on top of the need to build capacity for financing, enforcement, monitoring, communications for effective MPAs, and so on, in the Caribbean, coral reef managers are also facing emerging, uh, emerging issues such as co uh, stony coral tissue loss disease, sargassum influx, uh, as we've also heard um, in presentations at the symposium, uh, more intense hurricanes, et cetera. What can we do for um, policymaking to keep pace with emerging coral issue? And I would add to that with uh, emerging coral science. And I'll put that back first to you, Andrea, um, but I, I'd also go for some of the other panelists. So I didn't quite follow the whole question. Maybe you can give me a recap. Um, I think the bottom line is how can we make sure because there are so many emerging issues, um, so it's not just restoration science that is rapidly evolving, but uh, there are emerging threats and the threats are quickly emerging just as the science on these threats is quickly emerging. So what can we do for policy making to keep pace with emerging coral issues? I think that's a tough one because my understanding is policy is always much slower to respond to the, the problem, right? So the more we're engaging in conversations like the one we're having right now, the more we're reaching out to be part of those policy processes at the national, international, and, and, and local levels, so then you can respond. So some of those issues, sargassum, for example, is maybe a more local issue and interacting at that local level is where you can intervene immediately, but implementing larger scale policies in minors, and I'm not a policy person, um, is a slower process. I don't know if that's a very satisfactory response at all, but that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. David, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to pick up on that. And I think Andrea's made a very important point that when, when you make policies around specific things, of course, it takes time to do that because you need to have sufficient knowledge and science and expertise, observations from stakeholders and so on, uh, local knowledge as well. And I think it's important to realize that there's much more than just a coral reef issue um, for those on the ground trying to get policies around this kind of change is that with climate change, we're really now managing for change. And just as we have you know, moved towards an adaptive management process now for dealing with coral reefs and, and many ecosystems, adaptive policy processes are going to be necessary. And again, this is a very strong sort of uh, pointer for the, at the global level, so IPCC and the IPBES, so these are the climate and the biodiversity technical platforms um, informing the convention systems that they report to, are really sort of advocating that the policy processes need to essentially um, become much more adaptive and, and be conscious that, that uh, policy responses will have to come to, uh, what responses will be have to be made to unexpected um, events that will happen in the future. And I think for coral reefs, we're certainly at the front of that, but there's a very broad, you know, there, there are many other systems dealing with the same challenges. And I think it's one particular thing in our coral reef community, I think we need to do is to look outside of our community and link up with, with other ecosystems, uh, other sectors who are facing similar challenges and to join forces with them. Thanks. There was one question in the chat that I think um, relates to this, as it also um, addresses a, a local level of policy making or of management. Uh, so we have Graham Patterson, who's asking policy related to coral reefs still seems to be largely based in the international and national spheres. In many places where coral, are, uh, coral reefs are dying and conservation projects might uh, even be active, there seems to be little focus on policy changes being identified and implemented on the local level. Things like local regulations on chemicals being used in sewage processing, agricultural practices, sunscreens, etc. Is there any sort of checklist that organizations can use on the local level or resources to take policy actions on a local or regional level? And I would actually address that at David again. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. So that's a great question, actually. And it actually relates to an issue that's with, a, with an African group of, of colleagues, actually. We've just written up um, a policy paper on, on precisely that, which will be coming out in the middle of August. 
And it's really that, so I, I can't offer you a checklist. Um, that's the thing. There, there will be a checklist of solutions to certain specific issues. But it's really that while we need this coherence at the larger scale, and we really address this in the paper we wrote at the regional scales, uh, you know, with, with the international policy and so on, but these and national systems really need to support local adaptability. So local governments to be able to respond to the challenges that they face locally and to be able to bring in the diversity of stakeholders and cultures and mindsets that there are uh, at local scales. It's very hard to provide overarching guidance to include all of this diversity, but I think it's, we think it's possible to have much more of a, you know, really connecting people with nature and really trying to emphasize the need to bring the power down to local scales within global guidances and so on, such as the new global biodiversity framework to implement those and to effectively protect and conserve and restore natural systems so they provide benefits to people. But yes, we need a lot more of that. I think it's in the national to local coherence uh, that, that there will be a, a lot of work will be needed to, to make that happen in the coming years. Okay, thanks, David. Um, any of the other uh, panelists that would like to add to that? If not, then there was one additional. Oh, Minister Nasir, please. Um, yeah, I. When, when we talk about protected areas, you know, and uh, also legislation. Um, uh, in coral reef areas, I can um, draw it from examples that we have from the Maldives, where we have uh, we have um, we have legislation to protect coral reef areas, uh, specifically under the environment law, existing environment law in the Maldives, and uh, and using this, uh, it is very um, very easy for the government to uh, establish. Uh, coral reefs as protected areas based on ecological assessments, uh, also based on socioeconomic assessments and um, legally gazette them as uh, coral reefs. You know, I think this is the only way uh, you can protect coral reefs. And uh, of course you have to, um, the, 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 the problem here is that when, when you set up a protected area, protected coral reef, you have to, uh, you have to have a management plan, which sometimes is very tricky because you have to work with uh, management plans with the local councils, local governments. And this is what we are tackling with right now. We have we have 72 coral reef protected areas in the Maldives, and we are trying to find different models involving the local communities, you know, involving the private sector, involving the, the, the tourism sector, uh, and also, also other sectors. We also have, uh, we have, we have also recently started, apart from, uh, establishing legal protected areas, we could also establish them them as um, OECMs, for example, other effective area based conservation measures. You know, so there are there are different tools that we are we are trying to use uh, for uh, um, for important coral reef uh, habitats, and I think this is the only way we can we can we can uh, uh, we can improve uh, uh, the local efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, also, everyone for your uh, your contributions to this uh, sort of after session. I think it was good as it allowed us to um, to go a little bit more into detail into some of the questions that we couldn't address before. Um, so we've come to the uh, end of our full two hours. I really like to thank all the panelists again for your time and contribution and for your readiness to, uh, to answer all the questions that were being asked. Uh, and also to the attendees, uh, thank you for your interest. Um, now it is time for us to launch, officially launch the report. So in a few minutes, it will be available on the website uh, of the International Coral Reef Society for you to download um, with exec executive summaries in um, different languages uh, as well. So thank you for your attention. Um, thanks to the panelists and uh, have a great 
rest of the week in, uh, in the um, symposium. And I look forward to seeing everyone uh, again next year at the 15th ICRS, uh, then in person here in Bremen. And I hope that the panelists, uh, together with uh, additional participants, will come together for a follow-up uh, session where we'll see what happened uh, over the next months with the uh, events that are now uh, upcoming, uh, the UNFCCC COP, the Biodiversity um, Conference of Parties, um, to see where we're setting the course for Coral Reefs and where we are in one year's time. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Have a good rest.